Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. The shading on these are primarily just one shade, and it's a, a common shade that matches up uh, many of them. But in this particular kit by uh, Bosworth, uh, they come in little rods here where it's got a num several of them on, very easily labeled. And with these, you should be able to take them and to, uh, let's see, we'll need a right for this visitant here, and get an idea as to what size you're going to need on your particular tooth that you may be uh, going to use. If this particular method isn't available, one of the more common methods is just simply by measuring with a uh, bully gauge or a measuring device. You can measure the size of the teeth or what's more commonly done is you can measure the uh, width of the space. And once you have the width of the space measured, then you can transfer this on over to the size crown that you would like. And then go to the kit and uh, select the size of crown. Have to be a little bit uh, careful. Sometimes we think we can measure from the adjacent central because the central should be the same size. Uh, this is uh, one way of uh, doing it. Sometimes it'll be a problem in so much as this space may be closed a little bit or it could be opened uh, uh, as a result of drifting or spacing or other reasons. And so uh, uh, although we attempt to uh, make it similar to the adjacent central, we usually will try to fill this space regardless of what it is and sometimes it will have changed uh, a little bit because of a, a variety of reasons. In this particular instance we're going to be using a uh, an RM3, a right uh, maxillary number three for our central and as we fit this on here of course it usually will come long. Some of these teeth with uh, periodontal uh, uh, problems or surgery or recession will need the length on it. For our situation here, we don't need the length, and so this is a matter of uh, trimming it down. I might indicate one of the things in uh, these particular crowns is that they can be contoured cervically, and you might be able to see this or, or see it with the uh, contouring pliers. If we were to take and actually bend the cervical and hold it just a little bit, we actually are able to close the cervical down and narrow it down a little bit out of what the shape it originally was. Uh, this particular material here is very s similar in consistency to uh, fingernails. Uh, it's about the closest thing I can think of, but uh, we'll need to shorten it up and I would suspect we'll need to shorten it uh, oh, three, four millimeters all the way around because it was uh, quite long and this is again the type of thing that we can trim and then check and then we'll trim and check. Uh, find out whether we're getting to the right length here. Well, we're still just a little bit long, particularly in our inner proximals, which we didn't get trimmed up enough, so we'll trim up the inner proximals. The trimming on these are not real critical unless you're planning to smint these on directly with a smint, and this is not commonly done. Usually these are uh, uh, washed with acrylic, and I'll, we'll show you how to do this. Uh, and then they are trimmed and polished before they're smitted. So if we do happen to cut them a little bit short, this is generally not a problem because when we wash them with acrylic, we'll pick it up. But this would be trimmed about uh, to the right length for this tooth now. These don't fit very accurately at the gingiva. Our posterior uh, uh, ion crowns uh, fit fairly good, many of them, uh, at the cervical. These are kind of large at the cervical and frequently are not designed to fit. Our most important area here is for aesthetics, one of the primary functions of our anterior temporaries, and that is that we want to match the space and fill it in, make it look similar to our adjacent central. And uh, we can fit them to the gingiva and get a more accurate fitting once we have established our right size and width. And in doing this, we're going to use uh, some acrylic and we have a material that we, is called trim. There are many, many acrylics on the market. Uh, students uh, at school here use Dural-A as a common uh, material. Before I get into uh, putting some acrylic in here, one of the things we probably should do would be to lubricate this uh, Visodont fairly well. Acrylic likes to uh, stick to the uh, Visodont, so we'll take and uh, 
lubricate our model here fairly well with just some water soluble type of lubricant. In the mouth we have saliva, usually the saliva is more than adequate to uh, uh, serve as a lubricant and we don't normally lubricate in the mouth, although some people I guess uh, prefer to lubricate, it can be done either way. But with our acrylic now we'll be mixing this in a dappen dish in this instance and we'll take and uh, place oh half a dozen drops into a dappen dish and again we want to cover this up fairly rapidly th because this is very highly volatile and evaporates very readily this monomer and then we can take and uh, just squirt in some uh, of the powder until our uh, liquid is about covered once we get our liquid covered so that uh, there's not too much left showing then we can uh, take and mix it up we'd like a little bit of a soupy mix here one that we can handle to flow into our tooth and it could even be a little bit soupier than that I anticipate it doesn't take a lot of mixing then we want to take and to actually fill our crown up with our material here and you can use a little number seven spatula to do this if you want with. These come in handy for a million little things around the office. Sometimes this is mixed with a uh, wooden uh, stick primarily because uh, people forget to wipe off their spatulas and it hardens on the spatula and it uh, is a little bit more difficult to clean off but if it's wiped off while it's soft generally there's no problem at all. Usually we'll let this set in the temporary crown just for a moment or so until our gloss starts to disappear from the surface and we start to get a little bit of a, a doughy type consistency. Once we've got a, a little bit of a, uh, the gloss going and our surface is starting to get a little bit doughy, then we can take this and place it onto our tooth preparation and kind of press it to place. And this can be positioned and moved along. It's nice to leave this little uh, tab on at this stage so that we can uh, use this as a handle and this is the way it usually will slide on and you can uh, see from here that it comes out the edges a bit. The key on this is to kind of watch this acrylic until it sets and different acrylics will take different amounts of time to set and it depends on how you mix it and how much powder and liquid you get into it and of course in the mouth it'll set a little different than it will on the bench because of the moisture and the temperature and what have you. The key thing is not to uh, go away and let this harden too much because if that occurs it's going to lock in the embrasures of the adjacent teeth. We've got undercuts on both the mesial and distal here that are filled with acrylic and if that hardens uh, we could have a very difficult time getting it off. What we would like to do is to wait until this material actually is uh, in what we call the rubbery stage and so you may want to play with it a little bit. Uh, in the office we do this frequently enough so that rather than uh, playing with it we simply time it and uh, we know just about how long it's going to take from a time standpoint. But uh, again here we're just kind of watching it and, and playing with it depending upon how much time it's going to take out of the mouth and under the lights here. Uh, heat is a fairly significant uh, catalyst uh, to our acrylic. Oftentimes we like to kind of start to loosen this a little bit before it uh, gets real hard because uh, we can sometimes remove it, take it off, and uh, check it. And occasionally at this stage we can even take our uh, crown and bridge scissors and start trimming off some of the excess on here so we haven't got as much to cut later on. Some people like to leave these set on until they're quite hard. Other people will take them off fairly rapidly. This is a uh, heat generating process and uh, it will generate heat and it could uh, by some uh, cause some additional trauma to the tooth simply by the amount of heat that it does generate. I think this is uh, starting to firm up off enough now so that we can probably get it off and, and keep it off. One of the things we have to be careful of also in replacing this back on here is many times we'll develop a little flash around the edge 
and when you place it back on you may pick up some of that flash and it'll fold over and once it folds over and gets on the inside of our uh, preparation then when we seat it we can't seat it completely and you get uh, a real mess underneath and we haven't got a real good impression of the tooth. Uh, I like to take this off at this stage. Yeah. We will leave it set for just a second yet because it's still uh, fairly rubbery. Some people, as I say, will let them get fairly hard on there. But uh, we, when we take it off, one of the things that we'll want to do is to rinse the mouth fairly thoroughly because there is uh, monomer in this acrylic. It does taste a little bit uh, poorly and it has been known in some instances to actually uh, burn the gingival tissue and occasionally you'll find a uh, person that may be allergic to it, although I think this is extremely rare. And uh, if you, <coughs> excuse me, if you take it off and rinse it uh, quite uh, thoroughly and don't allow any of that monomer to stay in contact with the soft tissue much more than a minute or two, I think your chances of uh, having any uh, tissue damage are very much minimized. I like to take this at this stage, once it's reached a fairly firm consistency such as this, and uh, finish hardening it up by placing it in some hot water. I've usually got a hot water bath uh, right in the uh, office that I can take and um, put it in. We'll just put it in a bowl of hot water here for the moment, see if we can't uh, harden it up. One other method of uh, doing anterior crown forms that uh, is involved with sizing and selecting is uh, with our celluloid crown forms. And uh, this is a older style that uh, occurred before the uh, polycarbonate crowns come on the market. And this is a kit of one of the crown forms. Actually, they usually come with a guide. You can see on the back here which uh, will tell the particular tooth and it measures the tooth in millimeters and this is where uh, the Boley gauge and the measurements become much more valuable because you want to measure off the tooth you need then you look to your chart, find the measurement on the chart and then select the tooth that uh, applies to the particular measurement. The top here is usually just a measuring uh, gauge area in which you can check out different uh, teeth here. Underneath we have the actual crowns which are practically all sized in a little uh, plastic tube and on the tube they have the number marked but one of the problems is the numbers are not marked on the crowns and as a result uh, it's fairly easy to mix them up once you mix them up it gets to be a problem in trying to figure out which one is which you actually have to take a bully gauge and start to measure them back and compare them with the chart and what have you before you can find it so Usually we don't get into a problem unless somebody happens to drop the top here, then we've got a couple hour project straightening them back out. But uh, in our instance here, I suspect we're measuring about uh, this uh, right central number four. And uh, this we could take, and again, if you were to size it on here, you'd find that this would be very large, and you'd have to take and to trim it to place. This is celluloid here, and trim's very easy. Uh, this was used almost exclusively for many, many years in uh, constructing crowns. And uh, I think there is 90% of the offices that I know of still have them, and uh, I, many of the offices still use them uh, and use them for certain specific uh, areas and certain specific reasons. But basically, they're not fitting quite as well or quite as close. and. Uh, uh, we got one here that's just a little bit wider than we would like to fit on there. It's not going to slide on just right. But uh, let's see if we can get one that's just a hair smaller in size and trim that one down. Uh, with these now, they can uh, have acrylic put in them or they can have just uh, a temporary cement put in them. Uh, before we were using a very much acrylic in the mouth, they frequently just had a white uh, temporary uh, cement such as our uh, uh, temporary cement that we use, temp bond or temp pack or uh, zinc oxide eugenol cement put on them. But you could see if it's had a white cement put in it that it could be very, very 
uh, poor in its uh, appearance. What is commonly done nowadays is that uh, this area is, uh, well, we got a lot of lubricant on here. Everything's getting slippery. Uh, if these are used nowadays, usually there'll be some acrylic put in it, just like we put in the other acrylic and, and slid on there. Uh, this doesn't uh, attach to the acrylic, and frequently the, after the crown is made, we'll take the cellulite, cellulite off, which leaves a little bit of discrepancy contact area-wise, and uh, sometimes if we don't take it off, the fluids will get in between the acrylic and the celluloid crown and create some problems. And uh, So they're, as I say, they can be used and are used, have been used for years, but they're not real common. Uh, I'm sure you may run into them, so I'll give you some idea of the celluloids. Well, let's look at our uh, crown here and see if we've got it hardened up, and we may want to trim it down. You can see the margins uh, fairly well on this now, and you can, in this particular type of a preparation, this is a porcelain jacket preparation, which has a, so a shoulder all the way around it. And this makes it even easier to uh, see the margins. I suspect that your full coverage uh, crowns will be the ones that uh, you'll be required to uh, temporize most frequently. There are a variety of other types. They become more complex on it. But uh, what we need to do is to trim this excess off. And this is now hardened. So we have to do this with a hand piece. And uh, we have set up for you a uh, a heatless stone, which is a common method of uh, trimming these. And um, it's just a matter of, yeah, we got to get it running right here. Going in with our heatless stone and trimming it down. These can be trimmed with a variety of different burrs. We can use vulcanite uh, stones on it, vulcanite burrs. We can use a variety of different stones or denture stones, acrylic uh, stones. Uh, uh, the acrylic will, as you're seeing here, kind of fold over when you're cutting on it, and you may have to trim it back or break it off with your finger. It kind of folds in on you. One of the burrs that I like to use, uh, and for the sake of uh, uh, moving this along a little bit quicker, we'll switch to this, is a what we call an arbor band that has been designed for the handpiece. And uh, this we can take and trim the excess off. It cuts a little bit cleaner than the heatless stone, but uh, everybody has their own particular abrasive to use in uh, trimming this. And uh, you'll find probably many, many types in the office, and you'll have to be learn to be uh, adaptable or flexible to whichever type is uh, being used in the office. If uh, we end up with a little bit of an abnormal shape on here, such as uh, we do here as we're trimming down to the cervical, we'll just have to, uh, you can see the shape as it's getting a little bit abnormal. We can take and recontour the labial surface of the tooth or whatever we need to uh, bring it back to uh, shape. There's some question as to uh, how far an assistant should go in relation to uh, trimming and fitting these particular uh, type of anterior crowns. It's pretty difficult to take one and size it and fit it without uh, washing it and trimming it down to the margins because the anterior, the margins in these anterior temporaries are very critical. Uh, they're usually thinner and uh, more sensitive to uh, irritation and of course we get just a little bit of recession on them and we're going to be involved in a fairly significant amount of uh, uh, gingival recession, which in turn will uh, result in our uh, margin showing or the gingival receding a little bit. And uh, you know, from an aesthetic standpoint in your permanent crown, if we get the slightest amount of tissue change here, we're going to be in uh, rather big trouble. Uh, in this instance, our crown margin is uh, short of the gingiva here. Uh, as most of these types of preps and uh, the Visidon will be simply because we can't get the rubber pushed back or manipulated uh, like you can in the mouth. Once we have it uh, sized and fit like we would like it, then we can trim off the remainder of this tab. 
on here. And again, this can be done with your heatless stone or hand piece. These incisals are fairly rounded on here, and if your incisal edge was left uh, long on it at all, we could take and uh, uh, shorten the incisal edge or square out our uh, incisal edge to look more like our adjacent tooth. And this should get us pretty well back into shape. Now, normally at this stage, we would go to polishing. Does that need to be shortened a little bit more? Maybe we want to shorten it a little bit more. We'd go to polishing this up. And uh, there, again, there's a variety of ways of polishing it. I think the most common way of uh, polishing would be with a, uh, uh, a lathe wheel and some pumice. Although this, and this is usually found in most all offices. Uh, anybody that's uh, adjusting or working on uh, dentures of any nature pretty much has to keep a uh, pumice pan uh, available. That size-wise might be a little bit better in our adjustment. So now we could uh, take and to polish this back. And as I say, if you had a lathe wheel, you'd probably wor be working in a, uh, on a lathe and a lab pan with some pumice that would uh, be polishing it uh, you know, in this manner here. And I think this is probably the most common way of uh, polishing on these uh, uh, particular crowns. Another way would be if you didn't have a, a pan readily available to you would be to use a uh, soft wheel, uh, rubber wheel of this nature, in which you could uh, go in and attempt to uh, start to smooth out any surface roughnesses. Uh, this is not usually the, the problem on this. The problem is getting it to the right size and getting it trimmed down so that it uh, fits the tooth and uh, uh, looks decent. Well, we won't spend a lot of time uh, with you uh, polishing on temporaries. So we have this pretty well sized now. And uh, it's a matter of uh, cementing it into place. And we may well want to uh, uh, cement this into place now. Uh, we're going to be using for our cementation a temporary material called temp bond. This is a Kerr product and uh, is probably, according to most all of the supply dealers in uh, the lower Michigan area, the most commonly used material by quite a bit. And it's a very easy material to use. And we'll go through the mixing of it here with you. It comes with its own uh, pad and tubes. We put out equal lengths of this material, and if we got a new tube, usually we'll squirt just a dab of it off in the corner before we use it, simply because uh, sometimes there'll be a little separation in the uh, tube, and this will kind of uh, make our first mix uh, a little bit inaccurate. Uh, we found working with the dental students. We'll just get a dab out of the end out of here. Those look rather clean at the end. There wasn't much clear fluid like we usually find. These are equal lengths of material on here. And we don't need much, just a small dab uh, to do it. And this can be mixed with our usual spent spatula. And it's just a, a stirring together type of an action, uh, should, which should take 15, uh, 20 seconds at the most, and it stirs into a fairly creamy mix. This is not a reinforced material, but it is a zinc oxide eugenol and does have some sedation. It also uh, does have a little bit of a surface reaction with the acrylic, which uh, is usually not enough to be a problem. Again, the desirable way to take care of our spatula is just to simply wipe it off with anything around, Kleenex frequently in the office, and uh, it's clean. Our uh, number one uh, Tarno instrument is a plastic instrument, could be used just to uh, lay some of this material in here. We haven't got to fill the crown because it's a fairly accurate fitting crown, but just simply to lay a little bit of it around the inside of the tooth, and we'll simply place this into place and press it on down. And in the mouth, it'll usually take about from one to two minutes for it to harden which is a, a fairly short period, and then you, we can go right back at it to uh, clean it off. 
this material doesn't uh, stick uh, nearly as hard as our caulk IRM that was used with our posterior teeth. That doesn't mean that, uh, you know, we can't use caulk IRM up here or we couldn't use this in the posterior. This is probably more commonly used all around the mouth. And, uh, but if we had one that started to come off and didn't seem to stay or had very little uh, abutment or was tapered or something of this nature, we may want to use a uh, cement that had uh, greater strength to it. This is a fairly weak strength cement. And uh, we've got another, while this is hardening up and I want it to get thoroughly hard here, let me go over a different method we have of uh, making some anterior crowns. And uh, I'll put a different one on here and lubricate it up here again. And again, the mouth or saliva is usually adequate lubricant. But uh, the other way of making anterior crowns is primarily to have an impression of the tooth to begin with. Sometimes uh, this is not possible if a patient uh, has uh, knocked off a crown and lost it or busted his porcelain jacket and doesn't have it or if uh, you know an accident of a variety of nature has occurred uh, they don't have a tooth there to for you to get an impression of but if you do have a tooth and you are able to get an impression to begin with which is the most common uh, way on it you can get uh, an impression in uh, wax again we could take a little wax impression of the tooth uh, this is not the most common way, particularly in the anterior, because it's not real accurate. We could uh, take a gel trade impression and pour up a study model, and from the study model we could make these little plastic uh, wafers on a little uh, vacuum machine, and uh, the school is using this uh, quite commonly now, and uh, it's starting to become uh, fairly commonly used. And from this we could uh, place acrylic into the tooth that was missing, and then simply uh, place this on the back on the, the preparation or on the patient's mouth over the top of the preparation and it will uh, fold and more mold the uh, tooth that we want so this is a uh, you know another way of uh, uh, doing it a fairly common way is to uh, take an alginate impression before the doctor does the preparation and again assistance uh, uh, hygienist could help with this very easily and uh, I have taken one here with the original Visidant tooth in place. And uh, should set right back on here. Uh, now with this uh, alginate impression, we can place acrylic in there and then simply place it back into the mouth. And we'll try this, see how this goes for you, and uh, see if we can make a little temporary back on that. One of the things uh, with our alginate is usually we like to retry this back in the mouth before we start to uh, place it in there with our acrylic in it just to make sure everything is going to place all right. Many times we'll pick up uh, interproximal tissue which prevent it from going down and these can be simply trimmed out of here. Uh, you can take a number seven spatula and clean off uh, these bulky interproximal uh, areas. In fact is if you had a tooth that had a uh, uh, chip on it uh, you could go back into the particular tooth and carve the chip out of it. And this, you know, when you take and, uh, let me get a close up on this for a second again, you can take and, and carve this uh, alginate, uh, very similar to what you could wax or other material and uh, uh, create a specific area. You could create a long, narrow slit if you wanted, or you could uh, do other things with it. and. Uh, uh, use that to reshape their particular tooth. You'd normally be doing that down in the area where you had a fractured tooth. We haven't got a fractured tooth here, so we can't really do that. I'll get these chips out of here and then we'll go to uh, see if we can't place some uh, acrylic in here. Okay, we're gonna get our tooth. We're dealing with our tooth right here. Uh, one way of putting this in as we can do it the same way we did before, but I'd like to give you a little bit of different method uh, so that you can have some uh, variety of experiences. And one way is simply to uh, put some liquid and some powder down into the tooth that we'll be working on. I can locate my dropper here. 
So if we placed a, a drop of liquid down in our tooth and followed this up by a, a little squirt of powder, there really is not a mixing uh, that's necessary for our, our acrylic to cause it to set. Can't really uh, tip it up too far. I can't get my liquid to run down in there. But I think you can see approximately uh, how we're doing it. Just a little bit of addition from powder and liquid. Uh, oftentimes we'll end up by putting a little extra powder on the surface of it so that we've got plenty of powder on it and then just more or less shake the remaining powder off. Uh, we don't like to have too much monomer, free monomer in here. And we either can uh, soak it up with the, the powder and uh, again shake it off or we could take a little bit of air and uh, blow it in there. Uh, either one. But once we have a little bit of uh, this acrylic piled on here. So that our surface is thoroughly moistened, then we could kind of either put this on here at this stage or we could wait for it to uh, dough up just a little bit. I think for our purposes, we'll slide this on here right now and just kind of press it into place. And this should mold back the original uh, tooth that was present. Sometimes the tooth that was present may be uh, a little bit deformed. That may be why the dentist is uh, putting a anterior crown on. By this method, we end up with the same deformation in the anterior tooth. We haven't got any good method of uh, checking this, so we might want to uh, time it. In the mouth, I'd leave it set for about three and a half minutes. I don't know, again, how long we'll need to let it set here. But let's uh, just take a for instance and say we'll let it set about four minutes and then see whether we're uh, to our hardening point or to our rubbery stage, I should say, or whether we're short or beyond, we'll have to kind of slide it off to be able to tell. But hopefully that'll give you some idea as to uh, the shape of uh, one method of doing it with acrylic. Let's look at our other tooth and see whether we're hardened up. And you can see from our uh, uh, jacket here, or not jacket, but a little uh, scaler here, that we're hardening on this. And it'd be a matter of just taking it and, and starting to trim the excess off. But again, remembering not to have any upward motion on this, or you well could pull the crown right off on it. And uh, the excess should trim off fairly easy for you with a, uh, a scaler. But again, oftentimes this will be subgingival and we'll have to get into the gingival crevice to uh, uh, remove some of the cement that uh, has accumulated. You might want to use floss down in between the interproximals. You may want to use an explorer to uh, put through the interproximals, just depending on the size of it. These interproximals are open far enough so that we can actually get a, an explorer clean through these. If we get a lot of uh, this acrylic, or pardon me, the cement, zinc oxide eugenol cement on the surface of the tooth, you may notice a slight softening that, uh, to the surface that comes as a result of the uh, eugenol in the material. This is oftentimes not a, a real big problem, but uh, uh, has been known to, uh, if you get a lot of it on, to actually get a sticky surface on the tooth. And this is something we try to avoid. But generally speaking, this would be about uh, the stage we would uh, hope to end up with, with a temporary. And at this point, uh, you'd want to give the patient some instructions. And some of the instructions would simply uh, include the fact that uh, this may discolor. There's various things we have in our diet and smoking and coffee and iced tea and a variety of things that uh, may well discolor this. Uh, gum sticks to it. Uh, sticks to most plastic work in the mouth, and this is why the big advertising fad of the free dent gum that's not supposed to stick to uh, plastic uh, in the mouth. Oftentimes I'll just ask patients to avoid uh, chewing gum, but if you get somebody that's uh, trying to quit smoking or something, you'll have a tough time and they'll uh, want to chew something so you could switch them into the free dent. Uh, we anticipate soreness around the gingival tissue, which the patient can be told, but the soreness should be differentiated from a, 
uh, anything severe, acute or throbbing uh, nature, they should check back with the dentist. If it's just a uh, soreness, uh, uh, ask them to you know be patient, and this will be an irritant and should be tolerable, and it'll go away in a few days uh, in the area. But uh, they should need some instructions on it. One of the things that's uh, rather critical is the bite, and we want to get back to the bite. But uh, right now we've got about uh, four minutes up, so let's see if we can uh, remove our alginate and find out whether we're too quick or too late. I guess we're just a little bit early because it's a little bit soft, but you can get an idea as to how that is uh, formed to our former tooth. Uh, as this does harden, you'll get a lot of flash on this, and it'll flash way out and over the surface. We can start to, uh, yeah, we're about right, I guess. Trim the excess off of the adjacent teeth. This is often a good time to have them close and get some establishment of occlusion uh, on it. And it's a good time to clearing the flash up and start to uh, loosen the tooth up so that we can start to work it off. And I hope we've got this in time enough to work it off. See if I can get a little bit sturdier instrument here to uh, work this down with. Maybe a sickle here. If it starts to set up as this has done, it could be in trouble. And it looks like we may be in trouble. But uh, the only way you can uh, avoid or get anything done with this is just to pull vigorously and uh, get it off if it's starting to set up. But again, you should get your timing down fairly well in the mouth and then we can trim off the excess material on this. We'll have some of the flash which goes onto the tissue and that can be simply trimmed off and washed off on it. But we were able to pop it off all right. Uh, took a little bit of pressure because of the rapid setting on it. And again, we have a uh, temporary which uh, could be trimmed down and uh, it's hard already and uh, ad adjusted and adapted so that it'll fit onto the tooth. And it'll slide back on here now, all right, even though our interproximals are a little bit uh, filled. One of the key things, and I might slide this back on here and uh, help you with it, is uh, the occlusion. Uh, very frequently our occlusion will be high with uh, temporaries, particularly of this type. And one of the ways we have of uh, adjusting this occlusion is with our articulating paper. And one of the ways I do it, which is a little different than some, is that I'll usually take a red articulating paper and have the patient establish their occlusion in red. And frequently they'll make uh, many marks on the type of dot, which we can take a closer look at here, I guess. And it'll leave you a, you know, a whole variety of uh, marks. Now, with our temporary, and we won't bother to trim this before we adjust the occlusion, usually we'll trim it and then adjust the occlusion. We can slide this back on here, and then if we close it down, we usually find that it is high and that it hits prematurely. And one of the ways of marking where it hits is to either take the same articulating paper, or I usually take a different color, and uh, tap on it and mark where it's hitting. And it'll usually show you quite sharply exactly where it is hitting. Now this needs to be adjusted until all of the red spots, which are no your normal centric occlusion, are covered with blue paper. In other words, we're back into a centric relation. Sometimes you can tell this by the way the, the sound of the patient's tapping. Sometimes uh, we can tell it uh, uh, by using the patient as an indicator. They can frequently tell you that it's high or it's low or it, it uh, doesn't feel good or it's hitting too quick or uh, what have you. And, but if we were to slide this back off and if we had our interproximals trimmed, it would slide on and off there a little easier. Usually we'll take it off to trim it. And when we go to trim it, we'll frequently uh, use a heatless stone. Let me slide a heatless stone in here for you. And just start trimming it on back. This is a uh, trial and error type of an experience, and you have to know approximately how much is going to be needed to uh, 
be taken off before you can uh, work on it. There's a variety of different other stones that you could use too. But it's a matter of uh, adjusting it and sliding it back on the uh, visadont and to see whether it's uh, uh, right and then taking it off and adjusting it or if you had a small stone or wanted to you could actually adjust it right in the mouth. It'll frequently leave plastic particles on the mouth and you'll have to clean those off the occlusal, occlusal surfaces of the posterior tooth before you have them bite or else they end up with uh, acrylic all over their occlusal surfaces and they can't get back into their occlusion. Well now on the removal of uh, our crown uh, with this particular material, again, this is not usually a very big problem because uh, the temp bond is a fairly weak cement. And with the removal of it, we usually will get in with a uh, instrument. And if we've got an acrylic surface, we usually can bite into it uh, and pop it off. I may have to show you that again. I think we had a lot of lubricant on here that may have uh, facilitated that coming off fairly easily. But uh, if we get a hold of it with a uh, jack cat or a sickle or most any type of a scaler and actually dig it into the surface, we can engage the surface and then we can pull down on it. You could go up to the margin and, and tuck just underneath the margin and pull down on it. Many times you may need to uh, take a bite in two or three places. You could use your adjacent uh, tooth as a little bit of a fulcrum for prying on it to loosen it on down. But uh, it should drop off fairly easily. This would require us at this stage to go back and to finish uh, cleaning the abutment off, which uh, frequently will have uh, remainders of cement, particularly around the cervical, uh, which will have to be cleaned off, and then the tooth itself, which we can clean off and rinse. Again, recognizing that this is usually removed without anesthesia, the tooth will be sensitive. It will be sensitive to the touch of our metal because we've got exposed dentin. And oftentimes, just a small cotton pliers and cotton pellet will help wipe off the bulk of the cement. But uh, this, you know, is a time-consuming job. Uh, the two real key time-consuming jobs uh, on a crown preparation are our temporary construction and particularly cleaning the cement out because this cement has to be meticulously cleaned out of the gingiva. You leave some cement in there and, boy, you'll get into a, a problem. And then the other thing is, upon the removal of this temporary crown, we frequently will end up with 101 fragments of cement, both on the abutment and in the gingival tissues. And this has to be very cautiously picked out and rinsed out and washed out and wiped off and uh, uh, sometimes takes as much time to uh, construct a temporary and get it on and off as it does to make the whole crown. And uh, it is a procedure where we uh, can't do a lot of damage to the uh, mouth uh, only damage that uh, could be done would be as if our temporaries were left exceptionally long or we had the cement that was left in the crevice uh, that we could result in some tissue uh, changes. Uh, these tissue changes wouldn't be, you know, severe and uh, you may have to remake the crown to adapt to them, but we're, these are supposed to be done under supervision and supervision meaning that, you know, a dentist or somebody in authority usually will check these. A hygienist uh, should be, if she has her registered dental uh, assistant certificate, should be allowed as a supervisor to check and to make sure that there is no impingement upon the soft tissue when the patient is sent home with a temporary on. That might uh, cause some tissue changes, particularly in the anterior. That's one of the key things which uh, we're looking for on this. The only area where I anticipate that too much could be done from a critical standpoint. All righty, for our laboratory exercise today, we're going to uh, divide the class into uh, three groups. Uh, the first group uh, that is, we'll be going and placing rubber dams. These are uh, a group that's already been scheduled for several weeks and uh, be one third of the class, the last third. And uh, this is a very important area too. We haven't uh, possibly spent quite as much time or videotape uh, type of demonstration on it, but I anticipate that uh, if, the, if and when an exam becomes developed uh, for the registered dental assistant that the application and removal of a rubber dam will be a essential part of it. And uh, I don't know whether it'll be an anterior or posterior or exactly uh, how it'll be handled. 
but uh, we will need to do it and so we would like everyone to have uh, an experience with it and to feel reasonably comfortable. Uh, this is something that uh, takes a full uh, two hours uh, to do and uh, many times the gals haven't been able to complete this in a lot of time and uh, we will try to uh, open the lab during our last period uh, and keep it supervised so those of you who didn't get a experience doing it or don't feel comfortable in placing a rubber dam may be able to get a little bit of free time to uh, uh, work on the placement of rubble dam in pairs during that last period of our lab session. But we would encourage you to get promptly uh, uh, up to the clinic and uh, today we're going to uh, try going back to the seminar rooms to begin with and the uh, seminar rooms that were originally assigned to you and then crossed out on the slip in the uh, clinic postings will be the seminar rooms that you will go to and see if we can't get uh, things organized and operating a little more efficiently. Last period we went straight to the clinic and we found out that the gals weren't quite organized and ready to go so possible if we spend just a few minutes in the seminar rooms this morning we can uh, get you uh, rolling a little bit quicker when we get to the clinic but I encourage you to get moving rather rapidly on that. Now the next third of the class that we'll see first will be the one third that uh, placed rubber dam last week. They didn't have a chance to work with the uh, posterior ion crown forms. Uh, we will see that one third of the class down in the laboratory first. And we will work with our anterior crowns to begin with on the first hour. And then in the second hour, we'll work with you on the posterior crown forms and the section of class that uh, already has done the post to the last third of the class that has already done the posterior crown forms last week they will come to the lab at 10 and work on the anterior crown forms this kind of a complex schedule but we want to get as uh, many people into these areas as we're kind of working in and out of them so let me repeat that again those that were taking rubber dam for last week will come at the nine o'clock session and will apply anteriors first and then at 10 o'clock they will stay and put on the posterior. Those that uh, placed the posterior ion crown last week will come at 10 o'clock and work on the anterior this week and we hope that everybody will, will gain an experience. That'll still leave uh, some of the class to finish up uh, with the anterior crowns uh, during that last uh, period but we will have gotten most of you an experience on it. There are a variety of things which we're asking you to bring to the laboratory, uh, very similar to what we did last week. We'll have to bring our typodont. This week we'll need to bring a motor and a handpiece, be a straight handpiece, so that we can uh, use our heatless stones to trim this acrylic. You'll need your number seven wax spatula and your short curved collar and crown scissors. We'll need something to uh, remove the cement with, a uh, sickle or uh, uh, curette. We'll uh, need something to pull the crown off with, which is more commonly a, a heavier instrument such as a jack cat or a heavy sickle. Uh, an explorer may well be helpful in getting some of the cement off. We could use our number one Tarno plastic instrument for uh, placing the cement into the crowns. Uh, number 114 pliers for those in particular that will be working on the posterior crowns for recontouring and shaping these uh, posterior metal ion crowns and of course your cement spatula. Uh, we will be furnishing you with teeth. Uh, again, we would ask you to be very careful of the teeth. You'll get them in an envelope and uh, you can try to place them into the proper place on the visitant. And we may have to a little bit of uh, juggling to find exactly where they go. And uh, then they have to be returned to the envelope and collected at the end of the period. The teeth uh, are teeth which the uh, sophomores uh, have cut for the, us and the anterior crowns that they have uh, cut for us they have just finished cutting Thursday and these are uh, I understand still on graded and so we'll have to collect them and uh, uh, make sure that they get back to the preclinical office for grading and then they're also held as a permanent record uh, so this is very important in the laboratory we're not going to have you size our anterior crowns because we want to get a crown that fits the space and uh, there's only uh, all these visitant uh, 
uh, teeth are the same in size, and so the space was going to be the same also. And as a result, uh, we have secured for you some uh, crown forms which come in a little box, and we will dispense them. We got half rights and half lefts, and uh, uh, these will be maxillary centrals, and hopefully these should fit exactly the size space that uh, you have in the visitant, which will be, again, all the same uh, size space. But our main effort will be to uh, help you shape and uh, contour the cervical so we get an accurate and well-fit uh, cervical on them. All righty, we can go to the laboratory and clinic and start getting busy to work. Listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu slash license.